All right, the time on my end is 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I would like to welcome you all for joining us today, whether you um, attended the last Community of Practice webinar in December or are joining us new today for our Jail Facilities Process and Policies for COVID-19 and Beyond Community of Practice webinar. And um, we welcome you here today. Next slide, Stacy. Again, um, welcome. My name is Tyler Logan. I am a project coordinator for the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice at Wayne State University School of Social Work. Next slide, Stacy. Thank you. Today we have a, a brief agenda. This session will last about an hour long from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, again, we'll go over some of the welcome and Zoom housekeeping items. We will then hear a presentation from Matt Costello, um, and he'll provide an overview of jail facility structures and processes. Um, moving on, we'll hear from Sheriff Asbel about the one mission efforts initiated between the Sheriff's Office and local public health department. And then that will lead to a section of the webinar where participants will hear from Dr. Warsaw on her experiences as a public health consultant working within um, the different agencies and stakeholders to provide a, a, the importance of a clear and effective collaboration across health and criminal legal institutions. Moving on, we will then have a panel discussion which you all will be able to um, present different questions and ask those to the panelists, um, those presenters who I just briefly discussed. And then we will conclude with next steps. Next slide, please. These slides will be, me will be made available on the CBHJ's website after today's webinar, just as our December Community of Practice event was. This session will be recorded. We will answer content related questions as we go along. But we will also do this within the presentation's Q&A discussion towards the end. You can um, present these questions uh, within the Q&A chat box that is also, it, it should be located at the end of your, um, bottom of your screen, I'm sorry. And then again, please, please, please do not forget to fill out the post webinar survey. The content that we get and the data that we get from uh, those surveys really helps us move forward and um, create better content as we move along with these community of practice webinars each month. Next slide, please. Thank you. And now I'll pass it off to Matt Costello. Good morning, Tyler, and good morning, everybody else. And, and thank you for joining us today for this community of practice webinar. I'm here to talk about the, the jail structures and some of the processes and procedures related to being in jail, and especially how that relates to the COVID environment by which we're all uh, trying to manage and navigate. I spent 29 years working in an urban jail in the Metro Detroit area, a pretty large jail population at max probably around 1900 individuals. As part of the CBHJ, uh, we're involved with seven or eight different jails uh, from a couple of different states. So uh, we get a pretty good sense of feeling of uh, how jail operations are working and, and here to talk a little bit about that because there's a lot of misunderstandings about jails and, and things of that nature. To begin this process, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a, a one question quick survey here and uh, if we could just bring that survey up and it just gives us a sense of what people's experiences were prior to this uh, webinar. One of the things when I first started talking about this, having worked, it's one of those peculiarities, worked so long inside of jails, you kind of forget about exactly how to describe them. You, you, you know it more reflexively than uh, through any other way. Um, so I thought the first place to start is, is really definitions. And when we look at these definitions, we really think about these as it relates to COVID exposure and opportunities, right? So each jail or each county or uh, police department usually have the, uh, their own local lockup. These are generally just holding cells where people are kept for no longer usually than 72 hours until such time as they're arraigned at their local court. So a local lockup, they're being exposed to other individuals coming in off the street uh, or people, the staff in, in those local lockups. Detention centers are the same. Detention centers tend to be a, a centralized place, usually in an urban area where that local police department bring all their new arrests into for processing and holding until such time as they've been um, uh, arraigned in their court uh, for the purposes of de determining whether they can stay in there. As we look at the local lockups and the detention centers, again, as we think about COVID, it's very important to understand that uh, while there's some enhanced questioning, some testing that may be going on here, they are still congregate kinds of environments. People are up close and personal uh, throughout all these. They're not individual kind of cells or anything of that nature. They're just big, large holding pens, things of that nature. 
if an individual goes to their local lockup and detention center, goes to their arraignment, and a bond is determined and the individual cannot meet that bond, they are remanded to their local county jail. Uh, the county jail, again, can depend on different sizes, but it's usually there's one county jail for each county uh, in that particular state, and it will hold detainees for both custody pretrial and custody sentence populations, uh, and um, males, females, uh, adults, seven, 18 and over. Uh, so again, when we think about a person being brought to the jail, they're not brought to the jail and then put in an isolation or a medical unit uh, uh, as part of that process. Again, uh, they're in holding tanks uh, or congregate cells where they're, where they're with each other um, and it can create some challenges as we think about COVID from there. The county jails are generally speaking are for people who are sent 365 days or less, at least in the state of Michigan. Um, but again, when we think about county jails, there are people that come into the county jails who uh, are not yet sentenced. So we'll talk a bit, a bit about that a little bit uh, later. The last item in terms of uh, the jail stays are state prisons. So these are people who have been adjudicated and sentenced by their court to prison time, right? Prison time can be anything from one day to the rest of your natural life. Uh, so these are people who, generally speaking, have no pending cases anywhere, that they're done with all their legal work uh, as they are related to state time and are now been adjudicated and remanded to the custody of the state prison system. It's important to also talk about this, too. This is a state lockup system, right, where the federal side also has their own uh, corrections setting. So this is really just for uh, each particular state's uh, uh, flow of individuals as they uh, come into the facility. So we'll go to the next slide, please. The interesting part about jails, again, from my perspective, is, is it, it, it houses people from crimes as simple as disturbing the peace to people with multiple murder charges and everything in between, males, females, um, uh, Again, it, it, the wide range of individuals that come into the facility are quite amazing. Uh, so the idea that individuals with the misdemeanors and the felony charges, they are again, all put into the same kind of area. The felony charges, when the, once they're adjudicated, this is where your population could end up going in to the prison system, right? So there are people who come into the county jail on a murder charge uh, and un, until such time as they're found guilty or plead guilty, uh, they are kept into the jail. Once they're found or pled on their cases, that's when they might be transported out into the state prison system for uh, a sentence as determined by the court. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, individuals who are sentenced to 365 days or less in Michigan are uh, stay in the county jail system. So uh, they would not be tr uh, transported to prison. Uh, they would remain in the county jail to serve out the remainder of their time uh, within that uh, particular facility. It's important when we think about county jails too, is, is sometimes people think, well, if I'm in um, uh, Oakland County, Michigan, and I get arrested, then I'm from Oakland County, Michigan. Again, a lot of jail populations are made up from people from different counties and communities uh, outside that county. So again, just because you're in a particular county uh, does not mean you reside in that county, it just means that the offense that you were charged with occurred within that county. So it's kind of a little bit of a different uh, scenario when you think of um, uh, larger city areas, particularly that there's a lot of crossover people going over different county lines uh, it's not the county where you reside in that you're held in, it's the county with which the alleged offense or uh, convicted offense occurred in. So um, it's just such a, a, a coming together of a wide range of populations. There's usually a classification process that occurs uh, within that uh, new book into the jail where you separate your misdemeanors from your felony charges. Uh, but again, initially everybody's kind of put all together in a holding tank area. Uh, and again, as we understand COVID, that is, is really a, a, a strong challenge uh, for correction settings uh, for that kind of structure that they're set for. Um, we'll go to the next slide, please. As we've talked a little bit about, it's also important to think about uh, some of the things we've talked about already, that individuals can be brought to the jail and they're called in a custody pretrial state. 
that means their case has not yet been adjudicated. They're, they're still on bond. They have court cases that are pending. They have not able to make their bond. So they'll remain in the jail until such time as either their bond is paid or the court releases them. Um, so they remain in that custody pretrial status until such time as the court finishes their case. Some cases can be very complicated, can go on for years. Uh, in my experience working in a jail, I had a couple of individuals who spent uh, three to four years inside the jail in a custody pretrial status uh, on a capital case. So again, there's no limit to how long you can be in a jail custody pretrial. Uh, custody mixed, this makes a bit of a sense if you think about people come in on multiple charges. So there'll be an opportunity for somebody to be sentenced on some charges, but still pending on others. Uh, so they'll wait until they're sentenced on all their cases to make a determination whether they'll stay in the county jail, be released to the community, or be sent to the state prison system. Custody sentence population is exactly as it looks like and described here. That's an individual that has gone through the legal system uh, and has been found uh, or pled on their particular charges uh, and been sentenced to county time. In Michigan, as I said, 365 days or less. Uh, is uh, what how the sentences are figured. Jail sentences are always, you can always tell too, are usually offered in days, not in months or years, obviously, because months aren't all created equal. Judges' sentences are always in the number of days, so 365 days uh, for somebody to be sentenced inside the jail. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. One of the things that we've seen uh, enhanced and, and to the benefit of everybody is the enhanced booking process within the county jail structures, right? So uh, pre previous to COVID and its uh, impact on the correction systems was individuals went through a basic screening of, you know, uh, yes and no questions. Are you taking uh, any medications? How's your physical health, mental health, substance use and abuse kinds of questions, things of that nature. Pretty, pretty basic kind of intake process. Um, what's happening now is, is that uh, in our experience in working with a variety of institutions is, is that this process has changed in a couple of different ways, very distinct ways. One is, is that uh, the local police departments and sheriff's offices are using much more discretion on those people whom they're bringing into the jails. We've noticed probably a 35, 40% drop in jail populations as a result of COVID, people are being given show cause hearings or dates of appearances to show up to court on a virtual court. Uh, so again, they're not exposed uh, or exposing others uh, to the process uh, of COVID as part of their book process or court processes. So uh, one of the things for the people that are brought to the jail we're seeing though now is, is that uh, they're actually going through and getting COVID tested right up front before they even walk in the door many medical teams inside the jails are meeting the individuals in the sally ports or shortly beforehand to administer uh, a COVID test. Each facility is kind of using a different kind of test. Um, but again, that's a significant change from where it was before. It's a critical step that has to happen because again, uh, these are individuals that are going to be housed around others. Even if we uh, uh, separate them out from the general population at this point, they're going to still be housed with other individuals who are new to the book process. Um, in jail structures, again, we think about COVID as spread from uh, inmate to inmate, but it's also staff to inmate and inmate to staff. So again, we look at jail structures and it's really set up to be, uh, most jails are set up for either direct or indirect supervision. The easiest way for me to explain direct supervision is thinking about the old school linear style jails where there's a row of cells and a deputy uh, our corrections officer goes down that uh, catwalk at prescribed times or non-prescribed times and uh, eyeballs the individuals, make sure everything's as it's supposed to be. In the direct supervision housing, uh, the actual corrections officer is housed inside the housing unit and those housing units, those cells open up into a common area. And again, so when we think about COVID uh, and these housing units can be smaller or they can be quite large. Uh, but again, uh, there's really no single cell housing here. These are people who are all uh, housed in the same area, sharing the same spaces and uh, showers and phones and things of that nature. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? COVID releases. Again, one of the things that we're looking at um, when individuals, particularly in this COVID culture, are being released is, is that we're looking to see what, how long have they been in the facility? What kind of test results do we have? 
What kind of contract tracing can we provide for this individual as they re-enter back into the community? Some people may have only been in there for 10, 12, 14, 72 hours. Others might have been in there for 10 months. So again, when we think about that process, we think about what kind of information do we have to provide to them and to the community for that contact tracing as it relates to COVID. This is a, a ripe environment for the spread of COVID and we've seen some of our facilities just completely shut themselves down uh, to any kind of uh, in, uh, entrance or access by outside professionals. Um, I did men make mention here in Michigan, I think it's more prevalent here is, is that uh, it is a fee to stay uh, up to $60 a day. So an individual could be, uh, will be really uh, given a, a bill as they exit the facility uh, for their stay here. So, um, so that, that's really the process that we look at for the jails. It's a very, very quick overview uh, of the uh, jail processes. It's much more complicated than that, especially the larger the facility you get in. Uh, but again, for the time allotted, that's a, a quick overview uh, of the jail processes. We'll go to the next slide please. And then I think my, I'd like to introduce now uh, uh, Sheriff uh, Brian Asbell, uh, the Sheriff of Peoria County, Illinois, to talk about his one mission model. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, this this is, is a graphic of myself and our Public Health Administrator, Monica Hendrickson, who unfortunately can't be with me today, but I'm going to try to do my best. Um, if we can just push it forward to the next slide, please. I, I want to begin by just kind of giving a little background of Peoria County. Um, Peoria is the, the home of Caterpillar tractors and Maui Jim sunglasses. How we got Maui Jim, I have no idea, but we have them both. Uh, most people know cat. Um, populations, a little bit over 180,000, uh, mostly urban. Um, the jail itself is, is about a 492 bed facility. We have some um, day rooms or some um, congregate setting bunk rooms that, that add to that if necessary, but that's where we kind of, it's, we're kind of rated for a 500 bed facility. Uh, the demographics is uh, of the jail population. It's, it's over half African-American and less than that with Caucasians. Interesting enough, the, the county demographics are only 18 and a half percent African-American. So that's, that's kind of painting the picture. And if you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, some of these, these lists that this community has made over the years, and it's something that really evolved into the relationship between public safety and public health. For example, Wall Street 24 seven uh, did a report where it actually identified Peoria, Illinois as the worst city for African Americans to live in the entire nation. And that was in 2016. We made great strides. We, we moved up to um, fifth in 2018. Um, segregated schools um, and, and just the, the violence rate. Um, obviously, we are not like Chicago. Chicago is the, the most populous part of Illinois, uh, but per capita in the rate of violence incidents, we, we have an issue. So uh, another piece that I often use is, is our, we did a mortality study, our health department does a mortality study on an annual basis, and it identified our African American population between the ages 15 and 64 are dying at twice the rate of their white counterparts. So next slide, please. This really was kind of the workings how public safety and public health um, joined forces. Um, Monica Hendrickson, our, our public health director, and myself, we both kind of ended our positions at the same time. And we truly have, you know, a common goal, a common strategy, one mission. Um, and there's a linkage between public self, uh, safety and public health. Um, I've often said, quit reinventing the, the wheel. Um, Matt just talked about reintegration. Um, the medical model has so many things that should be used in the criminal justice system. Um, for example, someone who goes to the hospital, they start discharge planning as soon as they walk in. They're, they're focused on continuity of care. They're focused on re-entering the community. Why aren't our jails doing the same thing? So we, we have these models out there. Whoops, we like to say power. <laughs> um, but long story short, we, we, we created this bridge between the two systems because we see, again, it, it is one mission. And... Um, 
we created a, a committee and we had a lot of stakeholders involved. We had our hospital systems, uh, social service agencies, mental health providers, um, EMS providers, prosecutors, judges. Um, it, was, it was a very big table. Um, and we were kind of looking at where the gaps are. We're trying to identify the gaps and how to, you know, focus on both public safety and public health at the same time. Next slide, please. Uh, and through this, what we've done is we've recreate, created quite a few programs for inside the facility. For example, here's a list of some cognitive behavior therapy, moral recognition therapy, um, a jobs training program. I, I truly believe my personal opinion, Sheriff Bryan says, employment is the number one influencer of public safety. Number one, we can find jobs and they have to be living wage jobs. Uh, we can reduce crime in our communities. Um, increase uh, mental health hours. Jails across this nation have become de facto mental health institutions, hands down. Illinois is no different than Michigan, no different than Massachusetts. Um, they, this unfortunately have from my, my opinion, poor policy decisions decades ago. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. Um, I think we're all dealing with the same problems too with addictions. Um, heroin and meth is huge in this part of the country. Uh, major uptick on, in heroin usage, overdoses. Again, this is a public health concern, but we're dealing with these individuals inside the jail. So we were very um, cognizant to, to create programs to help them with this addictions. MAT treatment, medical assisted treatment was one of them. Um, we use Suboxone and, and Vivitrol. We have a couple different options to use. Uh, case management, again, kind of following this medical model. That's what we, we brought in. And interesting enough, I, I hired ex-offenders to run most of my case management because they can build that internal trust. It's something that I can't do as, as a law enforcement professional. But if you bring in people that have been in the system, um, they're more inclined to build that trust and build that relationship and have successful outcomes. Um, our health department, they, they provide us social workers. So we have full-time social workers dedicated to this, this focus on uh, re-entry and, and reducing our recidivism rates. Uh, another big plus that we've done, and we've, we brought in our, our local colleges and our nursing students, our social work programs. Um, we have a medical school here in Peoria run through the University of Illinois. Um, so we get a lot of free labor, it, it, it helps them. Uh, and that was very crucial, especially when we went into COVID because we ran out of staff. And if we hit the next slide, I'll kind of get into that. <clears throat> so COVID-19, yes, congregate setting. Um, the world changed in March of 2020. Um, I went to work on March 9th and I've been here ever since. I think I've had four days off, literally, um, usually three in the morning till nine o'clock at night. Uh, there's just so much going on. And in addition to that social unrest, there's other issues that are going on in the community right now, um, trying to balance all of this. I, I'm in charge of public safety, the policing, as well as the jail and, and court security. So there's a lot of different pillars that we're in charge of. Um, but I, I'll say this, we were ahead of the game compared to the, there's 102 counties in, in Illinois. I think we were probably first or second for getting ahead of the game. And that was all because of the relationship we built prior to this with our local health department and, and our area providers or hospitals. Um, what we did in March was immediately open uh, an emergency operations center. Um, that was for communications. That was for all the different pillars that are involved, whether it be um, long-term care, short-term care, uh, emergency responding, EMS systems. Um, so we really sat down and said, it's coming. We didn't have any cases locally, but we really uh, prepared for that. We, we started um, Kermit of PPE. We knew that was an issue at the beginning there where so many different agencies throughout the nation could not get their hands on, on PPE, especially for emergency and hospital workers. Um, communication. We, we immediately started daily press conferences for our, our local community and was very transparent in the process. Um, and we, we were fairly fortunate. We, we made it all the way until July until we had an outbreak here at this jail. And um, 
it was bound to happen. It was just a matter of when and where. And, and we hold the line for as long as we could. You try to pinpoint how it got in the facility. There are so many different entry points, um, especially when you are dealing with asymptomatic, asymptomatic individuals. Um, but that's through this relationship, we were able to manage this fairly quickly. Um, testing the population. Um, Abbott Laboratories is located in Illinois. They, they did provide us with a large quantity of the, the rapid antigen test that really helped us out for procedures. Because you're still trying to balance operating the jail. You always have incoming arrests. So you always have risks there. You have court services. So there's, there's all these different pieces that you had to manage. Um, but we did fairly well. And again, it goes back to that relationship that you've made with all these stakeholders in the community. Uh, budget impacts, we, 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 I personally had a 40% budget reduction mid-year. Almost 50% of my staff I had to send off on furlough or get rid of their positions. So we we're doing more with less. Um, but the ones that we did have to furlough, what we did was put them in with the health department um, for a different payroll, and they became contact tracers. That was another community need. It's just, again, showing this, this collaboration and working together. Um, so we, we were successful through our first outbreak. Um, it was about a month. It was roughly 18% of the entire population. Um, and then we were good. We held the line again up until just about two weeks ago. When we had another major outbreak, and we're at the tail end of that right now. And that's roughly 25% of the population. So we were in a lot better shape on this second outbreak. This now, we, we had a plan, we had policies, we had procedures in place. It's just an act in that plan once we had those, you know, those first individuals that showed positive again. Um, vaccination, we, we just, just Monday, we started our vaccination of, of the detainees. And this was, um, <laughs> Here's where the politics kind of gets in and, and the personal beliefs um, starting to get a lot of negative feedback by some members in the community that just don't understand why we would vaccinate detainees in the jail before other community members could get the vaccination. So you have to navigate that too, um, in an attempt to, to make people understand. All right, next slide, please. It's a kind of, it's a lot to talk about in, in about 10 minutes, and I could probably talk for hours in relation to this, but uh, I put this quote here because I just talked about the politics, and, and that was something I had to navigate. Peoria is interesting, red state, blue state, um, it, it is involved with all of this. I think social media had such a presence in all of this as well. Um, Illinois is a blue state, mainly because of Cook County, Chicago, and where I live, Peoria County, most it's it's the rural counties of the state. They're mostly red. Peoria County is an outlier. It's blue, but I'm completely surrounded by other counties that were were I, I use the term red, but they were anti just about everything relative to mitigating any public health rulings. Uh, they didn't want to close down any facilities, and they are very outspoken about this. Uh, they often said, yeah, my surrounding sheriffs were doing press conferences every day saying it's unconstitutional. We, we can't shut these businesses down. And of course, our media was putting a spin on it where they're trying to, you know, put us against each other. And, and I made the statement where, you know, I also, yeah, I, I, rose, I raised my right hand to defend the Constitution, but I also swore to protect life and liberty. And we're at a moment in history where one influences the other. One person's liberty influences another person's life. Um, and that's really how we did this. We did everything we could on the public side to, to mitigate um, because there's, there's, it, it involves police as well as corrections. So that's all I have, Tyler. I, I think we can push it off to doctor now. Thank you, Sheriff Asbel. Next slide. And now we'll actually hand it off to um, Dr. Elise Worso for her presentation titled COVID-19 in Jails, A Physician's Experience Learning to Speak Several Languages. Thank you. 
Thanks, everyone. Um, I see there are 93 people still here. I hope I can encourage you to continue to listen to me um, and stick around and freshen up that coffee. I'll try to make it worth your while um, and give you some lessons that I've learned over the, the past year. Um, next slide, please. So who am I? Um, I'm an ID doctor. Um, I'm an NIH funded health disparities researcher. Um, I'm also X waved. Um, so although I did not get a formal addiction training, I prescribe um, buprenorphine and Vivitrol in my outpatient setting. I am an ID doctor in six county jails. I've been doing that for the past six years. I actually started working in jails about four years before going to medical school where I was a phlebotomist um, in some of the jails, which was an awesome job that I highly encourage for anyone looking uh, to really see how jails work um, and to really interact with people. Um, then in, in March of 2020, I was hired by the Massachusetts Sheriff's Association as a consultant or liaison for COVID-19 prevention, mitigation, treatment, and vaccination protocols. And so since March, um, I've been heavily involved in the whole Massachusetts jail experience. Um, next slide, please. Um, I, I was trying to figure out like a good way to describe healthcare delivery for people incarcerated in jails and I could have taken some scribbles driven by one of my four or six year olds, um, but this is this the point here is it's incredibly complicated to deliver healthcare in jails. Um, some, the, the in and out, um, you know, in jails, at least in Massachusetts, you lose your health insurance when you come in, then it needs to be reinstated when you get out. Um, the communication between outside providers on the inside. So to start with before COVID, um, healthcare delivery was, was complicated. Next slide. So, and what I found um, is that the clinic, there's clinicians, there's custodial correction staff, there's payers, there's public health, and we all work in silos. Um, we all have these comfort zones that we work in. So I have a clinic, um, I work in a hospital, and one day a week I go into the jail, but really my comfort zone is speaking more uh, and stuff outside the jail. And corrections officers use certain phrases um, that is a different language, payers, but we all use we're all talking about the same people, but it seems sometimes we use different languages to talk about them. Um, and so that's that's what I've kind of learned. I've tried to learn many different languages over this past year in order to improve the quality of care we deliver um, inside the jails. Next slide. I think I could have made a huge slide from here just talking about all the different languages, but I just wanna give you an example of what I'm talking about. So when you're talking about clinicians, you have outside the jail clinicians versus inside the jail clinicians. And there's tons of barriers for communication. HIPAA was put in place to protect people. I'd argue it actually prevents a lot of the healthcare delivery we want to make happen. There, every single jail, almost every single jail I go to has a different electronic medical record, and that's different from the places that they get their care at in their clinic, and that's different from the hospital. And then you have this uh, never-ending fax machine. Um, I'd love to take a hammer to a fax machine and make it obsolete um, because it's really preventing communication between providers. Then you have clinician between MDDOs, the PAs, the NPs, the RNs, the LPNs, and the PharmDs. So we all have our own priorities, our own background, um, and we sometimes have difficulty communicating. And also very important in the jail is mental health and medical. So what is a priority for me as a medical health or as an HIV doctor, for example, is getting someone's HIV viral load detectable. What is a priority for a mental health professional might be um, you know, getting impulse control over. So I think those, if my meds interact with their meds, then maybe we're speaking, we have different priorities when we start talking about the patients. So the custodial staff or the correction staff, you have sheriffs, you have superintendents, you have COs. And what I've learned in Massachusetts um, is that sort of each jail, each county, and only we only have about 14 counties in Massachusetts, so we're smaller than most, has their own way of operating. For payers um, in Massachusetts, most of our healthcare is delivered by for-profit organizations. Um, and so each of them have their own um, ways of approving medications and, and policies. And then within the public health system in Massachusetts, you have the city and the state. Um, and then you have what our government in Massachusetts is saying versus what the CDC is saying. Um, so, you know, just as an example about languages 
things like specific languages issues that came into question was the or the word what is an essential worker what is a frontline worker is a corrections officer an essential worker is it a frontline worker and these are the the actual words that we spent a lot of time discussing and debating and trying to figure out um, throughout the past 10 months um, next slide so the first case of COVID um, was January 20th, 2020. Um, the first case of COVID in the jail in Massachusetts jail, uh, prisons was actually in March 21st. And then we started having clusters in the jails emerge in April, 2020. Um, I wrote one of, the first, um, one of the first articles trying to talk about how important it is to start thinking about um, COVID-19 mitigation policies in jails that was published in March 28th, 2020. And since that time, we've almost all the jails have experienced clusters of infection even when I say the word cluster, and if I'm speaking to people who are working in public health, if you use the word cluster and you use the word outbreak, the word outbreak says something to people working in jails that is different than cluster. So even those small little words can, can mean differences and engage people in a different way talking about what's going on in their jail. We've had two deaths. I can say they were both 40 years old, which is way too young for someone to die, um, and one of them without any comorbid conditions. So um, that really shook me um, when you started thinking about who you thought was going to die from COVID and who ended up dying. It was not who I thought. And that I think we should take with us moving on in that the 40 year old that gets COVID, let's not ignore him. Um, he could potentially die just like these patients died back in March and April. And um, now we have vaccines rolled out to healthcare workers, corrections officers, and inmates. So as of last week, we started rolling out um, vaccines to people who are incarcerated. It has been incredibly exciting. People are accepting the vaccine, which is wonderful. I'm personally vaccinated with two vaccines. I feel great. Um, and so it's just a really exciting time. Next slide. Oh, I guess that was just to emphasize the language bit. <laughs> Next one, please. So I'm gonna go point through point with some of these lessons that I've learned. I'm happy to discuss them more um, as questions come up. So the first thing I listened, learned is um, honor the hierarchy. So working in a working, oops, maybe we're just gonna put them all out there. Okay, we'll just put them all out there. I'll, I'll go through each one, that's fine. Good, okay, stop there. So honor the hierarchy. So working in a hospital, training through medical school and residency, there was always a hierarchy, meaning you're a med student or an intern or a resident or an attending. Um, when I came into working into jails, there the hierarchy was much, um, had to be respected. And what I mean by that is, I could have a conversation with someone who worked a CO or a healthcare worker or something like that. And we could decide, yeah, that would be a good idea. But then the term running it up the flagpole would always come up. It would have to go up and then the sheriff would have to say, yes, this is a good idea. And then it would come down. I'm not making it, it wasn't super rigid like that, but I needed to have people believe in what I thought was important in an order for it to happen. So just having a few people without the sheriff's support was not going to make things happen as quickly and as, as easily. Um, the second thing, and I reached out to my colleagues in the Mass DPH, the Department of Public Health, who've been helping me, and I said, what would you want people to know about your experience? And they said, your services may not be wanted or welcome. I know we go into jails and we're hot to trot. We're like, let me help you. I got the answers. I know all about this virus. People may not want you there. So my suggestion is to tread lightly. Do not, I've seen a lot of people go in and say, oh, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. If you weren't, if you barely got your foot in the door the first time, they're not going to let you in the second time. Tons of outpouring of appreciation and respect for what they're doing, even if they're not doing things like you think they should, that gets a lot of help uh, and that will, will really enrich the relationship that you have. I would say respect human resources. So I don't, I don't know anything about human resources. I know there's tons of modules I have to do online. There's a lot of things about human resources that I did not understand. But when it came to COVID-19 and the jails, we benefit from having human resources at the table at every meeting. So human resources could help us with the policies, whether it be about vaccination, out time, paid time off, sick time, things like that. And that was important for keeping the jail healthy. Keeping people who work in the jail healthy is crucial to keeping the jail healthy. 
um, public health experts may not know about jails. And um, that's kind of why we're doing this is to, and the first two ones that you, first two presentations hopefully set a ground where that the word, the, the ways that jails work are different from each other. And it's not like you can just watch, you know, your local crime, you know, show on CBS or something and then walk in and be able to say, oh yeah, I know all about jails. I heard a few words, lock up, you know, solitary, boom, I'm, I'm in it. Um, people in different jails work together, uh, talk together, talk to each other. So what I mean by that is if I had CEOs, I'm working with CEOs in one county and we determine something, um, then the CEOs in the next county will soon find out. So it's not like you can do something in one jail and just keep it private. And so the lessons I've learned is just let it get out there, discuss it openly early as possible. Um, because the last thing that people wanted to find out was that one jail was doing something differently to benefit the people that work there or to benefit the people that were incarcerated in a different way. So early, often communication between the jails, between the sheriffs um, has really helped us in Massachusetts. Um, I would say don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. So early on, when we started to have infections in the jails, you know, it could, the best way of doing it would be that every person would be alone in a room for 14 days. So what does that mean in a jail? What does that mean for someone who is a risk for suicide? What, how do you actually make that happen? How do you deliver food? How do you make sure everyone goes to the bathroom? There are all these intricacies that might make that impossible, that every person who may have been exposed to COVID goes in a room by themselves. So what's the next, the next best thing would be two people in a room. That can't happen four people in a room. So it, you I found that I needed to be flexible and that my, my ability to be flexible and give some wiggle room to people, acknowledging that's not the best way of doing it, but we can't because of how the structure of the jail works, about how many people we have working, that was really appreciated. Um, so try not, I would say, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. In the end, it's gonna be really, really hard to make everyone happy. And so there will be Monday morning quarterbacking. Um, so you do something in a certain way, you've made a decision with the data that you have in that moment, and potentially someone else gets COVID or you find COVID somewhere else. That's a learning lesson. Um, I think if you in that moment, if you had a public health person or an infectious disease doctor and you had the corrections people, if you came all to the table and you made a decision together, that's important to know that everyone's voice was heard. There might be people that disagree with you. There probably will be people that disagree with you, but they weren't in the room hearing all the different things that uh, influenced your decisions. There's not always one way to do things right. That's what I've learned over the past 10 months. And then the last thing is just to tread lightly working with journalists and media. I think early on, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a ham. And so when people would come to me to talk about my experience and what I thought, I would be kind of vocal. Um, what I learned is that's not a great idea. Um, sometimes the people who want to get that story don't have your best interest at hand. Sometimes um, the things that you think would be public are actually not public. Um, sometimes things, I know, you know, sometimes I would say things that I would think are just sort of um, what I accepted as the truth. And, but they were really only the truth in my views. And I was speaking for way too many people. Um, so I think there are really good journalists out there and really good medias. Um, I had worked closely with my, my uh, public relations experts now. Um, I've done a lot of coaching on how to work with journalists um, and media. And I've tried to cut down the amount of appearances I've done. And I think um, that has been helpful in also gaining trust with the sheriff's organization um, to know that if something comes up, it's not that I'm gonna be you know, on the, on the TV prompter or whatever in the, in the next hour talking about everything. Um, so let's see, we're at 143, next slide. If you don't know, ask someone who you might. So in April, like 10, what is it, eight or nine months ago, I created this group, a COVID prison jail interest group. And we met every week through June and then that moved to monthly. That's actually how I met Brad Ray. Um, he started coming to this group and we started talking and changing and uh, exchanging best practices. So this was back in April, we talked about employee detainee testing, how to get PPE, um, re-entry issues. And now we're talking a little bit more about vaccine hesitancy. Um, and the, I have to say from this experience, uh, there has been great research and av um, advocacy collaborations initiated. So if you are in your county and you don't know the answer to it and Googling gets you nowhere, 
there could be someone out there. I'm happy to be someone that you reach out to. I love getting emails for help. I love connecting people together. Um, so if you are hitting your head against a wall, trying to figure something out, how do we get the Moderna vaccine translated into this language? How, you know, the information sheet, what are the regulations around this? What do I do if someone refuses testing? What are the, there is someone out there, you are not alone. There is someone out there that can help you. And maybe I can link you with that or Brad can link you with that, but there's someone out there um, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And lastly, um, next, I think there's one last line there. If you click one more time. I just got by with a little help from my friends, um, both from the social emotional support, um, also just from changing of information. And these, all of these states represented on this map would come together and we exchange best practices. And, and it, was, it was pretty incredible. Um, so next slide. So two of my mentors actually passed away um, during um, the first surge, neither of them from COVID, but um, I miss them greatly. They were both leaders in the field um, of being doctors for people who are incarcerated. They were doing it before it was cool. Um, and I really miss them a lot. And they, they inspire me to do what I do. And I hope I fully can inspire other people um, to do what I do as well. So this is my information. Um, I am active on Twitter um, and I have NIH funding. So thank you very much for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wurzel. Um, so now we'll jump into the panel discussion. Um, I do have some questions queued up on my end, but again, just to remind all of the participants on the line, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, please put those in the Q&A chat box and our team will filter through those and um, present them to me and then I'll try to get them in through this dialogue that we're about to have now. For our panelists on the call, um, as I ask you each question, um, there may be a question that's directed individually towards you or a question that's directed to the entire panel, um, which I'll, I'll differentiate. And then you'll have a couple of uh, minutes to answer and respond to those questions. I'd like to begin with uh, you, Sheriff Asbel. There was a question put in the chat box earlier around harm reduction. Um, harm reduction is a public health approach that aims to reduce harms related to substance use. It may include abstinence or not using substances at all. Sheriff Asbel, have you used harm reduction as a treatment strategy for the safety of public health? And that last question was the one dropped in the, in the chat box earlier. Yes, we have. Um, for, for example, when I talked about the heroin epidemic we have, we have safety kits for anyone that's at risk when they leave the facility. We're well aware that most overdoses happen after times of incarceration. Um, so we're given those tools not just only for detainees, but those members of the public can come to the jail at any time to get the safety kits as well. So huge advocate for harm reduction. Thank you so much for that. Um, Elise, yeah. you mentioned that vaccines were rolled out within the jails that you're currently working with. Can you provide some context around what is being done to ensure that those detained who want the vaccine receive it? And then I have a follow-up question for you. Um, there are usually two doses administered, um, one a few weeks after the other vaccine. Um, mm -hmm. What strategies can you suggest for following up on those second doses, especially for those who may have been released back into the community? I uh, love, I love these questions. Okay. Um, first one, um, I think uh, what we started doing is we have these sessions called ask me anything sessions. Um, so we did the first one in the jails and we brought in outside experts, so not jail staff to answer any questions that people had. Um, and I think that gave a lot of the people who are incarcerated um, a level of comfort. Um, it was not that you went into a room and said, you're gonna get the vaccine and we're gonna convince you. What I like to say is I wanna take you from hell no to hell maybe, that's my goal. Um, and, uh, and it worked, I think it started working. I mean, I, I go in, I say I was vaccinated and why it was important to me. And the other thing I think we have to stop doing is shaming people who don't want the vaccine because there's a lot of decisions that go into your why people take vaccines. And we know living through the past year, it's hard to know who to trust. I mean, I'm an infectious diseases doctor. I'm constantly, I couldn't convince my dad that COVID was a thing for a very long time. I couldn't convince it. So even the family, you don't know who to go to to trust the information. So if people need to take their time to come to the point where they want the vaccine, that's okay. Um, so those are the kind of ways that we've been approaching it. We've been head on tackling the issue of structural racism, Tuskegee, we're talking about it. We're saying, this is what happened back then. We know that might influence your decision. 
but God help us, black and brown people are dying way, way too much of this disease of COVID. And one way we can help you to not die is to get this vaccine. So let's talk about it. Let's not let this continue to kill off communities. Um, so we've been head on talking about those things, lots of translation into other languages. I've been making videos um, so that can be played on loop. I know some people are probably sick of seeing my face. Um, there was just a campaign that was set up in Massachusetts where they had people who were released from jail talk about their experiences in jail and what they went through, but why, you know, in the end, a vaccine probably would be a good idea. So all those things are in place. We're learning from it. Um, more than anything, you need to have people who have lived experience. I could not agree with Sheriff Aspel more. I am just some white lady coming into jail. I swear to you, I have a fancy golden retriever uh, who, you know, I, I just, I'm not the person sitting in the jail cell. And so I can tell you to do something with your life, but it may mean nothing to you because I've never walked in their shoes. So someone who has walked in their shoes saying, you know what, I got the vaccine and I think it's legit. Um, that's who we need. So we need pastors. We need people with previous incarceration experience. We need outsiders. We need COs to get the vaccine because then COs can talk about getting the vaccine in front of people who are incarcerated and normalize it. We need healthcare workers in the jails to get vaccines and normalize it. So to your second question about the whole process of how you get the person the second vaccine. In Massachusetts, the jail has sent two vaccines for each person. So we were worried about this. The smaller jails are actually having people come back to jail to get the vaccine. I don't know how that's going to work. I know that for a lot of patients who need to come back for their meds, that doesn't happen. I don't think I'd want to go back to jail if I didn't have to. So like, I don't know how that's going to work. Um, otherwise in Massachusetts, what's happening is everyone who gets a vaccine gets registered, they get a card, but they're also registered in a computer system. So getting your first vaccine is an automatic ticket, Willy Wonka ticket to get a second vaccine. You show up anywhere, you say, I got my first vaccine. And as long as it's the right name and date of birth, which I think might be an issue for some of our guys, because I know they have a lot of names and date of birth. So I've got a little bit worried about this, but if you show up wherever and Gillette Stadium is vaccinating, other places are vaccinating. You show up and say, I got my first vaccine. You can look me up in the system. That should get you the second vaccine. That's the way it's supposed to play out. There will be issues, um, but we know, I can tell you from a doctor's point of view, is that there's a minimum that between the vaccines, but we don't really know the maximum between the vaccines. So if it turns out, we don't want you to get your second vaccine more than four days before you got, before it's due. But we think, you know, although I'd like you to get it at 28 days or 21 days after it, four weeks, five weeks, maybe four months, that should be acceptable as well. So hopefully people will have some wiggle room. Thank you for that. Matt, this next question is for you. You have experience working with jails in many different communities. Can you briefly provide context around a few continuity of care strategies that have been successful for these jails and providing warm handoffs to community providers? Um, and this can be strategies at booking um, within the actual in custody section of the jail or upon discharge. I think it's an excellent question. Thank you, Tyler. And I, I think really the sheriff answered this earlier and it is uh, embracing and what we've tried to work with our uh, active jails now is, is that discharge planning starts at the book process, right? As soon as somebody's walking into the jail, if I'm waiting to a known release date, I'm going to miss 6% or more of the population. So discharge planning needs to start right up front. Now, again, as the doctor was also talking about, this is occurring on multiple levels, right? There are people coming in with mental health needs, severe medical needs, uh, substance use uh, issues, uh, housing, employment, transportation. So it's a really comprehensive uh, kind of discharge plan that has to occur. Uh, but again, if you wait, you have to start the process right up front and early in the process because the fluid nature of jails, if you, if you ask any most jail administrators the average length of stay, it's a really small number, several days, right? Uh, because again, people book and, and, uh, and bond very quickly. So the best models are exactly, I think, as the sheriff talked about, you find those community experts and bring them in and develop a strategy for developing that discharge or reentry plan right up front as part of your whole book process. Thank you for that, Matt. And then the last question I'll, um, I'll propose to either Sheriff Asbel or Dr. Wurzel. Um, you might be able to tag team that as well. Um, have you experienced vaccine hesitancy amongst jail staff? And if so, um, how have you encouraged vaccines? That came from the chat box as well. 
I'll start. Um, yes, uh, with our employees as well as the inmate population. However, I, I do want to acknowledge just because of the second shot variance, the timeline, there is only a subsection of our population eligible. Really, it was our sentence detainees. So we knew they would be here for the 28 days because we received pretty much Moderna, all the vaccinations here locally. Um, it, it's something even with, with the community. Um, I'm, I'm on TV a lot. I, I, I have a place here and working with our health department. I had several commercials. Um, they, they vaccinated me live on television. Um, and I went down with the MA population too when they're getting vaccinated just to kind of talk them through it. So um, it is a problem. It's something we're still going to try to communicate. It's, it's just a lot of hesitation. Unfortunately, I had an employee walk out on Monday too. Um, he was so polarized in his opinion that inmates should not receive the vaccination prior to community members. So it's, it's, it's navigating through all these, these opinions. Um, and it's no different, I'm sure, anywhere in the country that we, we just live in such a polarized world, but it, it hurt when it was in the workplace. And it, he was a good employee, but he was just so, you know, stuck on his own personal beliefs. But he's gone. Doctor. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, a lot of people said no and then said maybe later on and then I've gotten it after the first, there's some, just like with any change, even technology, there's going to be early adapters and there's going to be people that wait around. I mean, I know that the shot is not an iPhone, but there are a lot of analogies for it. I mean, the arguments that people are, the reasoning that people say to me, um, who the healthcare workers and the COs, they say, you know, I'm healthy as a horse. I've never got sick. I know so many people who got COVID and they're just fine. I'd rather get the infection itself because I heard it was better for immunity. So I guess a lot of the things that they're saying is grounded in a nugget of truth. I'm not going to deny it. You know, like they, there is a nugget of truth to say, yeah, as a 40 or 50 year old, chances are that if you get COVID, um, you won't die. Sure. Yeah, you're right. Um, but I guess what I've been trying to do, at least with this one CEO is sort of, you know, I went in, we talked about football. We joked a little bit. He told me he didn't want this, the vaccine. And then he said, but his wife wants him to get it. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, when you drive home, are you going to buckle your seatbelt? Um, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to buckle my seatbelt. He looked like, it. and I, I wasn't trying to be kind of a jerk about it, but maybe a little bit. I was just trying to say, oh, so there are things you do in your life that you've deemed a little bit uncomfortable, um, a little bit annoying, but you've done it to protect yourself. And it's not saying that you're, you don't, you may be the best driver in the world, um, but you're still going to buckle your seat and you're still going to have your kids buckle your seat, yeah. their seats. So I think the way forward is potentially using analogies of other things we do to keep my, ourselves safe. So if you told me if um, I could get uh, COVID and live um, and be 95% able to live, but if I got my vaccine, I'd be 100% able to live. It's just the idea behind like a vaccine, I mean, behind a buckle and a, and a airbag. I mean, it's just another layer of protection to help us. And then the other thing that really works is getting kids back in school because we all want our kids back in school. Uh, and that seems to be the conversation that works. So, you know, how do we get back to normal? This is one piece, one step of getting back to normal is getting the vaccine. Wrap it up. You got it, Tyler. And thank you all so much for um, the responses that you all gave. There were some questions that we did not uh, get to, um, but what we will do is answer those questions in the follow-up email that is sent out and make sure that there's an attachment um, for those specific questions as well. Uh, next slide, please. And I will hand it off to our director, Brad Ray, um, to finish it up here. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, I just want to thank everybody, especially the panelists, for joining us on this second event. I want to start by just telling you briefly about the results from the survey that we distributed um, uh, after our last uh, uh, event. I really encourage you all to uh, complete the one after this. So we only had 24 responses from our last event, but I want to tell you about half of the individuals that participate in this community of practice are in criminal justice, public safety sectors. About a quarter of them are in public health and then some are in other organizations. We found out that people did search regularly for information and about half of the people that responded said that it was 
difficult, either very or moderate, to judge whether or not information is reliable. So as we've been saying here today, that's one of the first reasons that we put this on. Even when we were getting involved initially in Wayne County, you know, it was very hard to tell, you know, information on COVID mitigation and which practices would be reliable. Um, a final thing that we did discover um, is that the, the, the information that people sought uh, most after was a tie between testing and vaccines. So as you can see here, our next event is gonna focus very specifically on vaccines. We're setting up an Ask, uh, Ask the Expert event. Um, so our newest team member, Dr. Wurzel, has worked with us to identify some, some national experts in this space. We're gonna be using breakout rooms so people can come together and talk about specific topics and ask questions as they have them. It's always on the third Thursday of the month. Um, uh, the next event here is listed. We, maybe we could throw this um, link in the um, chat feature just so everybody has it uh, for themselves. But you can go back to this link. You can find this recording and the previous recording there and other materials uh, at that website. And you can register for the next event. I also just want to stress something that others have said. You know, we got into this work to really, um, uh, we've made a lot of partnerships with stakeholders from across the U.S. And so we've gotten in this you know, uh, point of being able to connect people up and we want to facilitate those peer connections. So please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, you know, as Dr. Worsell said, if there is something you're Googling, you wanna have it broke down, you wanna just have a conversation with somebody, that's what we wanna be here. We wanna facilitate um, those conversations and try and find the right person for you to talk with. The last thing I would ask is as you exit this event, you'll see a post exit survey and I would just ask you to, to, to please fill that out. We want to understand the attitudes of the folks um, that are participating in these events so that we can tailor them uh, to the needs of this population. So thank you all so much for your time today um, and I hope you all have a great week.